Shut up and sit down. Hello, I am the Cyber Rift Guru. Welcome to my channel. Thank you for watching. Uh, so this is part two of my... It's going to be a three-part video on making the sign for the 100 subscriber winner. So uh, this uh, video is going to be about using Fusion 3D, importing the SVG that we created in the last video, and then doing the toolpaths. Uh, so I'm not going to walk you step by step through how to do that because it's going to take a really long time and it'll make a very long video. So what instead what I'll do is I'm just going to show you what I've already done um, and kind of walk you through the process that I went through. And then if there are any questions, just leave them down below and I can answer them. All right, so let's get started. Okay, so here we are in Fusion. I have the design loaded um, and I've uh, rolled the uh, history marker back to the beginning so I can walk you all through the process of what I went through to make the actual design. So uh, right off the bat, the first thing I did is I actually created a sketch. Um, let me turn it on. So I created a sketch on the XY plane and then I imported the SVG that we created in, <coughs> excuse me, in uh, Inkscape. Uh, it was pretty straightforward and I'll show it to you. All you gotta do is when you're in your um, sketch here, uh, put that guy on the screen for you. You just simply say insert SVG, you select the file and pull it in. Um, it pulls in your SVG now, uh, just something to note here, if you're, if you're doing this, a couple things. Uh, your lines need to be closed, um, and when you do import it in this manner, um, you see how uh, all the lines are green? Uh, that means that the points are fixed uh, here under, uh, you can see fixed or unfixed. And, and what that means simply is all the, the splines in, in the lines here, you can't move them. If you were to unfix the lines, it would make them blue um, or black, depending on whether or not they're constrained. Um, if they're blue, then you can move the splines around, uh, the, the arcs and the splines and the polylines around. In this case, we don't want to do that. Uh, you can see straightforward, we've got the little border, uh, the hammer, um, and then the words. So we'll stop sketch. Uh, next thing I did is I, I selected the entire body here to include the words and the hammer, and I extruded it down uh, roughly one inch uh, to create the body. Uh, you can see here, so you still have your sketch on top. Um, and then I pulled it down into the body. Now what you're seeing here is I, um, uh, I added a, an appearance um, to, the, to the part, um, the, the body here, so it looks like wood already. The first time you do this, it would not, uh, it would not look that way. It'd just be the standard sort of kind of gray taupe color. Uh, next thing I did here is I pulled, I extruded down to create the uh, sledgehammer area here. And then I uh, then extruded down all the letters uh, to create the, uh, the inset of the letters. Um, <clears throat> I'll get to this later, but uh, you don't have to extrude the letters here. Uh, it's easier to visualize while you're doing um, the uh, toolpath creation. It's just easier to visualize, but you don't have to do this extrusion here uh, if you don't want to. And the last thing I did is I turned off uh, all the bodies and then I extruded uh, the part up. Um, or down, however you want to look at it, to create this uh, two separate bodies here. So the first body is the actual um, text here, or the um, uh, the body one is the base, and body two is the inlay. And the reason we did that is what we want to do is we want to first uh, uh, create two separate setups: one that is around the base, and one that was for the very specifically for the inlay. And then we'll do a, a pocket for the um, we'll do a pocket for this guy, and then we will do an outline for this guy. Okay, so uh, that's uh, as simple as, as it is uh, to, well, to walk you through uh, the process of, of creating the actual image um, or turning the image into a 3D uh, body. And uh, if it matters, I mean, the, the, the wood here is uh, slightly smaller than an inch thick, um, 0.94, 0.95, something like this. 
uh, and then I extruded the 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 hammer down uh, uh, an eighth of an inch, 0.125, and then obviously extruded up the uh, inlay, 0.125, and then this I extruded down 0.125 as well. Uh, this extrusion, uh, quite honestly, the depth is not really relevant because we're going to be using the V cutter for that. So all the magic here happens actually when we get into cam mode. Uh, so in cam mode, what you'll see here is you have the same sort of bodies, but, but they're, they're kind of hidden a little bit. I've already expanded it. And then I've created a bunch of tool paths uh, under two different setups. The first one you'll see there, the setup is called main. And so I click on it here to show you that main means that it, this is the base unit uh, with the stock uh, set on the corner of the base so that it's going to route out the stock size. Um, and I'll show this to you here. We'll edit it real quick. Um, and so I based it off the model orientation. I did a, a stock box. Um, I, set, I manually set the point uh, origin right here. Um, and then from a stock perspective, I basically said zero offset except for the sides. I just wanted to give a little play on the left and the right. Um, uh, you, you can set it to fixed size, relative size, a variety of other things. I, I generally use relative from the size of the model. Uh, you don't have to, but uh, that's just uh, just however you want to do that. Um, all right, so, and then the next uh, a setup that I did is this inlay here. And what you can see here is the setup for the inlay is a different uh, same coordinate system X, Y, and Z, but a completely different set of origins. Now the reason I did that is because the inlay is going to be cut from a different set of wood, and I didn't want to have the uh, the cutter head offset the same amount from this corner that you see from here. I didn't want to cut from here in and waste all of this wood that's down here, so I created a whole new setup here. Um, and uh, so we're going to dive into the the first one, uh, the main here, and I'll show you what I did. So the first thing I did is I created the um, engraving uh, setup here, and let me let me I'll pull this out a little bit. Uh, and this is my my technique. Uh, you don't have to do it this way. This is just the way that I do it. I found that it works better um, for what I am doing now. In, in interest of full disclosure, I have not cut this yet, so I can't tell you that it's going to work the way that I desire. Um, but uh, I will be cutting it uh, here in the next day or so, and then we'll pour it back in the next video. So right off the bat, I created the two engravings, uh, and the way you do that very simply is um here, let me show you how creating a new engraving you do under 2d um your options here are really a uh, pocket uh, contour slot trace um, and then engrave down here is the magic that we're doing here for this one so we created an engrave um the first thing you want to do is set your speeds and feeds here uh for this case I'm, i have a makita router on my shape oko pretty much the slowest that it'll go is about 1200 or 12,000 rpms um most uh, professional CNC machines, um, the, the fastest they go is about 12,000. Um, so uh, you would normally be cutting at something like four or 5,000 RPMs. Uh, so this is important if you get into professional milling. It's not so important for something like this, but the, the spindle speed really sets your chip load and your chip load sets how fast your uh, cutting speed should be. So in this case, for the... For the um, uh, engraving, I, I let I set the the, the spindle speed here, um, and then let it auto compute the uh, the speeds and feeds for the cutting, lead in, lead out, ramp and plunge. Um, it, the last time I did this, these numbers seem to work fairly well. Um, uh, 39 inches per minute. That's fairly aggressive from a cutting perspective, but we're not cutting very deep at all when you're doing the the engraving, and I'll show that to you in a minute. And then once you do that, then you select your contour. What I did here is I just selected. This is where the um, I was saying the um, the uh, extrusion doesn't really matter. What I actually did is I selected the edges or the 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 um, uh, sketch outline, uh, not the edges of the uh, extrusion. Uh, it's just easier that way because the uh, the 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 sketch is is 
a closed gap. And you can see what it is. I selected, um, let's zoom in a little bit, uh, selected all of these, which are very straightforward, this, and then I made sure I selected the inside edge here uh, so that it's uh, it's doing the kind of black part there. Uh, set I, I The only thing I changed in the height of the, are these uh, first four here, or three. I set the retract height, the, the clearance height, and the feed height to 0.1 inches. That's my preference. Um, I'm not using clamps in this case. I'm just going to use tape to hold it down so the vertical height isn't too uh, terribly difficult. If you do have clamps that you know sit above half an inch or you know more above the, the, the part, you want to make sure that when the clamps are on the part that the, your, your retract height um, is set appropriately and your clearance height is set appropriately if your clamps are within the space where your where your uh, machine might be going. Uh, top height is set at the top uh, selected uh, height of the contour here, uh, which is just the top. Uh, alternatively, you could have just said stock top. Either one will work uh, in this case because the contour and the stock uh, height are at the same uh, height. Um, and then the, the, the bottom height here I set to the top minus um, this value, this offset was actually computed automatically. I don't know what significance um, this value has to be quite honest with you. Uh, you can set it to, you know, negative one, you can set it to negative uh, point one, and um, it doesn't really seem to affect the depth too much. Um, it does if you have a very large uh, engraving, but if you don't have a very large engraving, then the, the depth there doesn't really matter a whole lot. Uh, passes for engraving are very simple. There's nothing here to worry about. And then linking, uh, again, nothing uh, too much to worry about. The, check the uh, little box here, keep tool down, that keeps the tool um, closer to the work surface rather than going to the retract height um, or to the clearance height when it's in between moves. And then the maximum stay down distance is two, two inches there. So um, I know these might not make a whole lot of sense to you if you've never used a cam in a Fusion, but uh, you'll get super familiar with them if you start using it. Um, and so what I did here, uh, so you'll see here I did one engraving in what I called rough, and that is at that 39 inches per minute, which is a, a fairly aggressive cutting rate. And then I did what I call the exact same uh, tool path. All I did is I copied this one, renamed it, and then I changed the cutting speed to 20 inches per minute. This is the the what I'm calling the finish pass. It's it's slower. It's going to create a nicer edge. It's going to go the same heights and depths. Um, typically, when you do a finishing pass, you really um, there's there's lots of different. Uh, theories around this, but I generally just do a finish, finish pass at the final depth um, if I'm doing a pocket or if I'm doing a profile. Um, in this case, you're doing engraving, so it doesn't really matter so much. Uh, other than that, I list everything exactly identically the same. There's no differences whatsoever other than the speed that it's running. So the slower speed will knock off some of that roughness that you got with the higher speeds. Um, I did this the last time I did the an engraving. It worked pretty well. Um, I'll actually run these one by one. I'll run the rough first. If it doesn't look too bad, I probably won't run the finish. Um, but to be honest with you, we'll do a quick uh, open the simulation tab here and show you statistics. Um, it's 2.35 minutes uh, to run the first one. And then because we're running about half the speed, uh, the second one is about 4 minutes uh, and 15 seconds. So look, uh, you know, it's almost seven minutes out of your life to run these two. Um, by 3D printing standards, uh, <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> um, and just something to note here, again, we're engraving, you can see the, the I said it's a transparent, but we're engraving with an engraving bit. It's a V cutter, uh, 60 degree V cutter, half inch diameter. Um, and so that's what you're seeing there. Um, so pocket, let me turn off this body. What the pocket is showing you is, I'll edit and I'll show you the properties. Um, this is set at 20,000 RPMs. I probably won't actually pocket at 20,000. I'll probably pocket more like 12 or 15,000. Um, but I manually set the cutting feed rate. I like uh, pocketing at 35 inches per minute uh, with a quarter inch bit. Uh, that works pretty, I'm sorry, an eighth, eighth of an inch bit. That works pretty well for me. If it were a quarter inch bit, I probably would go a little bit faster. Um, plunge at 20. These numbers work for me on my shape Oko. Um, your mileage will vary if you if you go down this road. So the geometry, very straightforward. I set the geometry to the uh, uh, the, the chain that's on the bottom of the pocket. Uh, why did I do that? Um, no particular reason. You could have just as easily selected the top. Doesn't really matter. It comes into the heights here. Um, so again, I set the, the, the retract clearance and feed heights at 0.1, stock top. 
um, is the top height and the bottom height is stock top minus 0.135. That is the thickness of the wood that I have that I'm going to use for this. Um, now, if you uh, because we selected the bottom chain there, you could say uh, selected contour, um, and then it'll make it whatever that height of that contour is. Uh, I think I extruded it to uh, 0.135, but I don't know if I did. So this is how I control the actual depth for the cutting maneuver. Uh, so we got that pocket. The passes here, this is very important uh, for a hobbyist grade machine like the Shape Oko here. You want to make sure that you do select multiple depths. Um, in this case, I'm using, uh, I guess I should have showed you here, I'm using a quarter inch flat end mill. Um, oh, you know what? I'm using two flutes not four flutes um, so why that's important the, the feed per tooth rate changes and that changes your chip uh, um, uh, your chip rate uh, in this case it doesn't really matter I'm not going to change anything but um, I like to keep it consistent um, but it, it, it's a, it's an uncoated carbide bit so no magic there uh, the point is that when you have an eighth inch bit you don't want your depth per cut to really go much more than 50% of the width of the bit uh, so in this case, you have a 0.125 bit, so half of that is 0.0625. I found that works pretty well at the feed rates that I'm doing here. Uh, you could f uh, speed up the feed rates to, you know, probably 60 inches per minute if you wanted to go at, you know, 0 0.05, 0 0.04 um, uh, uh, depth per pass here. Uh, the shallower uh, you go, the faster you can go. Um, I will tell you, however, that uh, for the shape Oko, the faster you go, the less accurate cuts you're getting. And because this is an inlay, accuracy is pretty important. Um, so 35 is about as fast as I will go for the pocket and for the profile. Uh, it's important on this machine, again, this is something I found to use climb milling. Um, what climb milling means is it's cutting um, into the wood this way, the way the... Um, uh, the, the router bit is spinning, so it's actually pulling the bit um, into the wood. Uh, that keeps it tighter to the wood. It gives you a more accurate cut. This is what I found. Um, typically, uh, gener uh, conventional wisdom says you don't do climb milling ever um, because it is pulling into the wood. It could grab. It could tear. There's lots of bad things can happen. It's just a harder cut. I have found for the Shape Oko, for whatever reason, um, for the pocket, uh, climb milling works for me. Um, and we'll get to the why that's important later. Um, stock to leave, I'm not doing any of this for this particular thing. Linking, um, not a lot of whole magic, a lot of magic here. I don't use lead in as lead outs whenever I do the pockets, it's just my preference. Um, but I do use a ramp, um, and what, what that means here, um, so what, uh, cancel, and then I'll I actually should have just, uh, yeah, we'll do the uh, generate tool path. We'll show you what this means. So the helix lead in here, you can see what it does is it, it comes in and it spins in slowly into the wood. That creates a nice, um, smooth cut into the wood rather than a direct, uh, straight vertical plunge. What I found is uh, in wood, it's not too bad, but if you use an HDPE, when you plunge into it, it creates those little spirals. They stick to the bit and then things get kind of crazy. Uh, so this is the quarter inch uh, pocket tool that we're doing here. I'll show you, uh, um, if you turn stock on here, I'll show you a quick uh, simulation of it. Um, let's do a little bit of play here and I'll speed it up. You can see how it's, it spins into it um, and it's cutting it out like that. And then I'll speed it up a little bit more. Um, it's gonna do the profile, it's gonna go come down do the handle. For whatever reason, um, it did a retract there. I'm not sure why. Um, I would prefer that it didn't, um, so they didn't have the second uh, helix here, but it is what it is. It's fine. And then uh, it starts the second pass here because uh, we're going slightly over an eighth of an inch deep, um, and we're going at slightly less than 50% of an eighth, so it's going to do two, uh, actually three full pass uh, uh, because we're going down 0.135 from the uh, 0.0625 depth per cut. Okay, so uh, there's no magic there. Uh, it, it's doing what we want it to do. Um, you can turn the stock off. Um, you can see uh, the tool pass manual or, or the actual cut there. So uh, let me close that. All right, so next is the profile. So this is where I found it gets sketchy uh, for thick woods. Um, so I am doing a relatively fast cut at 45 inches per minute. 
um, and a very uh, relatively large cutter, which is a quarter inch cut. And now I have tested the Shape Oko up to um, 80 inches per minute, which is almost twice this speed. And with a quarter inch uh, bit, it cuts fine. Um, 80 is about to stretch where you get a little bit of chattering depending on the uh, depth of cut. Uh, so geometry again, top plane, there's no magic there. Um, I did add tabs. Um, here You can see here, tabs here and here um, on the side. So uh, what are tabs? Tabs are where it doesn't cut out uh, the material. It leaves it attached to the base plate. Why did I do that? Um, I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, same sort of settings here. Again, we're going down 0.95 inches. This is something that I'm gonna when I actually get the wood cut and I bring it in um, and get it uh, get it uh, humidified to the te the temperature of the room. I will measure it again and then make this adjustment before I export the G code. All right, so here we go. Uh, this is where we're gonna get to this uh, why these depths of cuts are important and whatnot. Uh, so uh, in this case, I mentioned earlier we don't want to use um, uh, climb milling a lot. I want to use uh, conventional milling here. And you can see the little picture that pops up here. Uh, conventional is where it's uh, the cutter is moving with the grain of the wood, uh, so it's actually more likely to pull away from the wood than pull into the wood. You can see with climb milling here um, that it's actually uh, spinning into the wood, so it has a tendency to pull it into it. Okay, so uh, this is a quarter inch bit, and I mentioned earlier you don't ever want to cut deeper than 50% of the width of the bit. So theoretically speaking, we could cut um at an eighth of an inch deep which would make this go pretty quickly um what i have found um I, it's just this machine or whatever if you cut at that depth um i have found that it has a tendency to occasionally um, grab the wood, uh, kick out and rip the wood off the tape that holds it down um, or cause all sorts of delirious effects um it, it's again it's inconsistent. I haven't nailed down exactly what's going on. I think it has something to do with the fact that I was doing a uh, climb milling uh, for a while, but it always seems to religiously happen when it's on the, the close to the uh, the end of the cut, where the the depth uh, the the cutter is pretty far down into the pocket or the profile in this case. Um, it usually happens between the, the last or the next to last uh, cut. Um, it'll grab the wood, it'll pull the wood in, and things will go all sorts of crazy. Um, so, how did I counteract that? First off, I'm using uh, conventional milling, that helps. Uh, secondarily, um, the step down, I made a very small 0.05. Um, 0.05 means uh, we can move fast. Uh, 45 inches per minute, I've pushed it as high as 60 inches per minute. I'm not going to do it for this case. Um, if I were farting around and I just wanted to do an experiment, I would definitely do 60. Um, I am fairly confident in the high 90 percentile range that 45 will work fine. I've done it before. I'm going to do it this time. Uh, when you creep a very small roughing step down, it zooms through the material very quickly, especially when you have a big thick bit. Um, and then, so what do I do? Then I do this thing called rough final. Um, and then it does a finishing pass. Uh, finishing pass here is slower and uh, it, it creates a nice smooth edge around the outside. Um, and you can see here, uh, it's, I guess it's here. Um, no, I don't know where the, uh, uh, it leaves a little bit and that's a finishing path. I can't remember how much it leaves. I don't know where that is right now. Um, so, uh, I, these uh, little options here, um, you can see finish only at final depth actually should be checked, to be quite honest with you. We only want a finishing pass at the final depth. Um, actually, I lied. We don't want a finishing pass at all um, for the outside. We're just going to sand it off anyway. We'll do a finishing pass on the uh, on the profile show to you in a minute, um, as well as a stop to leave. And then linking here, kind of the same settings, a five degree uh, 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 ramp angle here. The difference is the maximum step down is, is pretty large. I haven't quite been able to figure out what this value affects uh, directly because you know you never want to cut more than 50% of the width of the bit deep. Um, but this thing saying the maximum step down is almost three times, um, actually four or five times the size of the bit. So I'm not sure what this is telling me. Um, I've had pretty good luck with this value though on this cutter. Um, so it is what it is. Your mileage may vary. Again, 
Okay, the last thing we want to show you is the profile um, of the inlay. Okay, so let's turn this body off. Let's turn this guy on. Um, and you, by the way, you can see the uh, the tabs here where it's not cutting out. So, <clears throat> okay. Uh, so here is the uh, the profile. You can see it's uh, it's very much like the profile of the outside, except um you'll see here at the bottom there's actually two lines right near the bottom this is the finishing uh stage um and if i actually go to the top view here uh you should be able to see the stock to leave well maybe you can't all right so oops cancel close i wanted to edit this guy um, I will show you. So again, uh, because this is the inlay, precision is important. I cut uh, relatively slowly, um, uh, and I also cut slowly because I am using a sixteenth inch bit um, rather than an eighth inch bit or a quarter inch bit. Uh, so uh, I found these smaller bits; they will definitely snap if you don't use care with them. I'm using the sixteen inch bit because these corners uh, were not being fully routed out when I had an eighth inch bit. I should have taken a little bit more time in Inkscape when I created them to measure them out and make sure that an eighth inch, eighth inch bit would fit in there, but I didn't. Uh, so geometry, again, very straightforward. Um, just selected the profile. Heights, same, 0.111 all the way down. We're gonna go down 0.135, uh, which is the thickness of the, the material passes. Again, here we go. <clears throat> This is where it gets a little bit complicated. Um, we're doing a multiple pass. We are going to do a rough final, which means this final uh, cutting um, speed will come into play. Now, in this case, we're cutting uh, the regular feed rate is the same as the finishing pass. Um, it doesn't have to be. I've cut 35 and 25 before, 35 roughing, 25 finishing, and it hasn't uh, had any too much of a problem. So. Um, again, we're using climb milling here to get maximum precision and accuracy out of the machine. Um, down here, uh, stock to leave. This is important. Um, so we're uh, shaving off a little, just a little bit of stock from the actual material. Um, and there's two different ways you can do this: uh, the radial stock and the axial stock. Radial stock is the stock on the left and the right hand side here. Uh, the axial stock is the stock that wants to leave vertically. Uh, we don't want to leave anything vertically extra, so we only want to leave radial, and we take off four uh, four thousandths of an inch. Uh, we do this because we don't want this part to be exactly the same size as the profile or it will be nearly if not completely impossible to get into the pro into the pocket. Um, I have done this many times and I will assure you somewhere between 0 .004 and 0.06 is the kind of magic sweet spot for this machine on how much you want to take off of the actual uh, material here. Uh, now, that uh, allows ease of assembly. That will leave a little teeny tiny gap um, uh, when you when you assemble it. Uh, typically, the glue squeezes out through there and kind of covers it up. Um, and if it's uh, if it's a little big, then I'll just uh, mix up some glue with some sawdust and I'll fill it in. I typically, fill in the holes anyway, just because I'm OCD about that. So. Um, same sort of thing here. You can see five degrees. It auto computed this uh, 0.43. Um, uh, again, not sure what this value is because it's uh, very fairly large for 0.03125 bit. So, all right. So that's it. Um, those are the cam operations uh, for <coughs> the uh, for the plate. And so we'll turn the body back on here. And so hopefully. Uh, when it gets done, uh, you will, um, uh, oh, I did want to show you, uh, before I go too far, I want to show you the uh, simulation of the, of, the, of the engraving here. So let's uh, go ahead and click on that. So why did I extrude it earlier? Well, it just helps with the simulation, and I'll, I'll show you why here. If I turn the stock on, and I'm going to run this simulation, there you go. Uh, you can see what it's doing is, this is what it, the, the machine is going to plan on doing, right? Well, uh, if we didn't do the extrusion, what we would see right now is just the flat um, uh, uh, stock body. Uh, we wouldn't see this actual engraving at all. Um, and so you wouldn't be able to tell if it was actually doing what you wanted it to do. Um, and so again, I've done this a few handful of times and, and I learned that, you know, the extrusion is not necessary from a pure cam perspective, um, but it helps with the visualization of what you're doing here. And so what did we see here? 
So you can kind of see here, um, the, this black part right here is where the bit went all the way down to the, the target depth, which is 0.125. Uh, these kind of like uh, glossy shaded parts are the angles that it's cutting at. Um, and you can see if we kind of zoom out and, and roll forward a little bit, uh, I don't want to get the, that top light in there too much. There's not a whole lot of black that you can see, so it's not really cutting at that target depth uh, very often. And that is exemplar of uh, of this uh, engraving operation is it's going to use this V cut to carve the width out irrespective of the depth. Um, so if you can get the, the width here, like for example here, um, if you can get the width without going uh, uh, you know deep, then it's going to do it. Um, and it's, it's going to respect these outside boundaries here, um, regardless of the depth. So again, uh, you know, in the actual engraving where you set the depth, I just simply don't know what that value does because it never goes there. Um, and I'll show you actually, I just do a front view and I'm going to turn off uh, the body here. You can see this is, turn off that body too, uh, this is the actual tool path from a, from a, a, a Z perspective or a Z perspective. Um, and I'm, let me kind of rotate out a little bit so you can kind of see what's going on. So this is uh, this is the A, the at, right? Um, and the, the green here is a plunge operation and the blue is the actual cut. So if we go straight from the front, uh, what you're seeing is these vertical uh, uh, pull downs are the actual vertical maneuvers and then the left right swoops in here and then the, the yellow and the green here. The yellow is a, is a, is a, a rapid and then uh, and the green is a plunge. Um, so you can see it's not really, let me turn this body back on, it's it's very rarely ever cutting at that full depth um, of 0 0.125, 0 0.135, um, very rarely, um, even though, I'll show you again, um, under heights, uh, it said right here, negative 0.41, right, so almost half an inch deep, it says that that's what it's cutting down to, what the bottom height is, um, but you can see, very rarely, if at all, um, it cuts further than an eighth of an inch. So, um, again, I, I don't know what that value is. I've toyed with it. I've set it uh, super deep. I've set it not so super deep. Um, I will tell you, if you uh, set it uh, very shallow, it will it'll it'll respect the depth. Um, it won't go as deep as it needs to, um, which means it won't get the width that you're looking for. And I think it actually generates an error. To be quite honest with you, um, I haven't uh, tried that out. So. Uh, there you go. Uh, that is the um, the Fusion tutorial. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed uh, that video. It's a little bit long, but I kind of wanted to walk you through the process. Uh, it wasn't nearly as long as if I had walked you through actually doing the entire process, but I, I hope you got a good sense of kind of the complexities. Uh, the 3D modeling in this case is uh, really a minuscule port, uh, part of the total tool chain operations we're doing here. Um, but ultimately, uh, what it ends up with is G-code, just like 3D printing. Um, so uh, we're going to export those uh, G-codes. So we're going to and then run the G-code against the machine here, hopefully in the next uh, day or two, and then uh, get some video of that and, and, and show you the output. Uh, if it doesn't work, uh, uh, maybe there will be a part four of the video. <laughs> uh, I'll show you the, the mistake and then um, how to fix it if I can. Uh, so uh, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. As always, if you don't like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up anyway. Uh, leave any questions or comments down below and uh, any suggestions down below. That would be awesome. Uh, don't forget to subscribe. Uh, where is my sister? You can subscribe down. Hold on. Where the heck is it? Down there. Uh, the little uh, Cyber Reef Guru uh, CRG down there. And then I'll put a subscribe button probably up there. Something like this. Uh, one of these days, I'll learn my left from my right. So anyway, all right. So, hey, thanks, everyone. Thanks for watching. Have a great uh, uh, day, and we'll see you soon.